Hello everyone and welcome back to CES 2024. You're joining me kind of live from a very dark and dingy hotel room as we wrap up the show. And I want this video to be all about PC gaming and everything that I've seen at the show. And there's been some pretty incredible stuff. And I want to kick off with the big battle at the moment, which is all about OLED gaming monitors, because there seems to be so many of them. And the big fight that's going on at the moment is between both LG and Samsung, because of course they actually make the panels themselves. And we've got pretty much three hot new monitors monitors, or at least monitor panels, to talk to you about. And the first one is probably the one that's going to grab the most headlines, which is the 4K 240Hz gaming monitors. And both Samsung and LG have these panels. But the thing that's pretty special, actually, about the ones from LG is that they can be overclocked at 1080p, so you're going to have to down-res it, to 480Hz, which is incredible because there's not really that many monitors in general at all that will go that high. But when it comes to OLED, don't forget that they're all already so responsive when it comes to those pixel response times, so you're not really getting much motion trailing, which means when you're sort of moving your mouse around the screen, then you're not going to get a lot of motion blur. So that technology, paired with 480 hertz, I cannot wait to actually see it in person. It's a little bit of a shame that I didn't really get to see it, even though the monitors were there. The Asus one that they were showing off, unfortunately, it was just like a static background. But when we get this into the studio, we'll be testing this properly. But of course, the thing is, down resing to 1080p, especially on a screen size of 32 inches when you're going to be sitting quite close to it. I think this is a little bit of like a cheat headline grabber personally because eSports monitor people probably aren't going to be buying this screen size. You're not really going to be looking at 4K monitors in the first place. So the question really is who is going to be willing to actually turn this down because 240 hertz 4K is going to look well way better when it comes to sharpness. And again, because it's an OLED monitor, does it really matter that it's not 480 hertz because 240 it was already ridiculous so unless you're specifically playing properly competitive stuff, I don't think you'll notice a huge difference. And again, if you are playing something that's competitive, you're probably looking at a different, probably less expensive monitor in the first place, as these are rumored to be around about the 1200, 13, maybe 1400 dollar mark. It's going to depend on the exact one that you go for. But when it comes to monitors as well, don't forget as well that we do also have other types of displays coming, still talking about OLED specifically here. And I think a lot more people are probably going to be interested in the 1440p variants, because it's a smaller screen size, it's 27 inches. And once again, both Samsung and LG are actually making the panels for this. And I don't know specifically when it comes to HDR what the differences are going to be, because the only sort of people really that were talking about this were Asus ROG, and pretty much all of the monitors they were showing off we're using the LG panels, and they said that their variants will go up to 1300 nits of peak brightness, which on an OLED monitor is ridiculous because you get the true blacks paired with the super bright highlights. So really excited to actually see what's going on there. I do also want to say I haven't seen the Alienware version of this that will use the QD OLED panels, so the ones from Samsung, Samsung, the ones from Samsung. And interestingly enough, the 4K variant actually supports Dolby Vision. So I assume this is just Dolby Vision in general for both movies and games. But this isn't really something that we've seen before on a monitor. We obviously see this on televisions all the time, but this would be pretty cool actually because it would be a proper like, entertainment a battle station that's going to be great for everything. So yeah, watch that space anyway. But when it comes to 1440p displays, there are actually a few differences here between the ones from LG and Samsung, because the LG panels can natively refresh at up to 480 hertz. So again, that's the same as the 4K monitor, but the critical difference here is, of course, the fact that this is native, so you're not going to have to down-res it to 1080p. This is 1440p at 480 hertz. And this I did get to see, and honestly, it was ridiculous. I've tested I've tested so many monitors, this used to be my thing, right, uh, over the years, and I'd never seen the test UFO actually have basically no, like, literally no trailing at all. I mean, if you use like a high-speed pursuit camera, I'm sure you'd see a tiny bit, but to the naked eye, it, it was incredible. It was such a wonderful thing to see, but it's worth noting that the Samsung ones don't actually go quite as fast. They go up to 360, but there were also some ultra-wides on offer here today, well, today, this whole show, and the ones really that I mainly got to see were from Gigabyte and Asus and LG as well, actually, and the main differences that we're seeing this year, actually, is the brand new version, which actually is a whole different screen size. We're now getting 39-inch uh, OLED ultra-wide panels. And I'm a little bit disappointed, actually, that the Asus one was really curved. I think it was 800R. Some people will love that. 
But personally, I like to have like a subtle curve because when you do get such a big monitor, actually having it curved does help. I wouldn't want it to be completely flat. But yeah, these actually go up to 240 hertz and you can get them in both the 34 inch screen size that we've seen before and 39. So watch the space and I'll review them as soon as they come in the studio. Oh yes, and as I scroll down my notes here, I do also want to shout out a little bit of a different monitor. This was one that I saw at the Acer booth and they're doing the first like consumer gaming 3D glasses-less gaming display, which is a bit unusual because I've got to be honest here, I'm kind of very biased against 3D stuff because it genuinely does mess with my eyes. I'm really prone to getting headaches and things. So sure enough, using this tech was pretty impressive because you did get a load of depth and it uses some spatial tracking to make sure that you're actually seeing what you're supposed to be seeing. It's way better than you find from you know, glasses less tech about 10 years or so ago. But I didn't like the fact that, again, it did sort of hurt my eyes. And because of the coating that you've got on this monitor to make it possible, it means that just general images aren't quite as sharp. So I think it's gonna be very interesting. And if you do get the chance to go and see one and try it, if you're a big uh, 3D fan or glasses free 3D fan, then I would highly advise that you do go check it out. But I wouldn't necessarily want people to buy it without seeing it and without trying it for an extended period of time. Because if you're like me and you do get a lot of eye strain, then I think it's gonna be a bit disappointing for you. But it's pretty cool to see Acer doing something a little bit different and it uses their software for any supported game and I think there's actually quite a few um, to turn it into like a full 3D space so it's not going to use like the NVIDIA 3D vision that's now defunct. Uh, it uses Ace's own tech which is pretty cool. Glasses free 3D in 2024. Who saw that coming? So yeah plenty of gaming monitors to get excited about but of course there are other things going on at the show as well. Obviously both NVIDIA and AMD have announced new graphics cards and these aren't necessarily going to be like complete game changes. We've already done a full video on the NVIDIA stuff. You can find that in the top round corner of your screen where we actually get unboxing some of the GPUs, which is pretty cool. All of these will have between zero and 15% extra performance, it depends on the SKU, the 4080 Super is more of a price cut really than anything else, but the other two, well the 70 Ti actually has more VRAM, it is 16 gigabytes now with the Super variant which is pretty cool, and then the 4070 Super actually has around about 21% more CUDA cores in it, so a decent amount of performance, but that one is still stuck at 12 gigabytes of VRAM. And this is an interesting one because on this note, something that's gone a little bit under the radar that I've only just properly brushed up on is the new release from AMD, the 70 600 XT and this is already going around reddit and it's getting a lot of complaints and people saying this is AMD pulling an Nvidia because the amount of cores that this GPU has versus the 7600 is actually the same but there is a boost to power there is a boost to clock speeds and this does mean that if you were getting about 70 frames a second before you're probably going to be getting about 76 now so that's still about eight percent potentially extra performance, but it's gonna depend completely on the game. But of course the problem is, if it's not got more performance or not much more performance than the 7600, then this is definitely not going to be a 4K graphics card, which is when you actually would need all of these textures in the first place, not only for the image quality, but obviously higher uh, resolutions and higher levels of AA, for example, use a lot more of that free RAM, so that's when it's required. So uh, it's nice to have options. It's nice that this is still way cheaper than the 4060 Ti 16 gig that Nvidia was bringing out. So I would say put your Pixwatch down and sort of wait for the reviews really. But obviously we're not expecting a crazy difference again and it is a fair old price premium of about, what's that, about 70, 80 dollars over the normal variant. So no, in terms of value, it's probably not going to be worth it. But there are plenty of people out there that will either want more VRAM or will have a genuine need for extra VRAM that this will sort of fill. I don't know, maybe you're a Skyrim modder, some, something like that, right? It, it does serve a purpose, but if you don't like it, that's absolutely fine. We don't need to like, overly complain about it, we just don't buy it, we can move on. Got that. And then, oh yes, something that is going to be very, very interesting going forward. The two new standards, I say that very loosely, uh, for cleanly building a gaming PC. So both MSI and ASUS have a new solution where they're actually putting a lot of their connections on the motherboard around the back. This means that if you're building a system with a window, which let's be honest, like 99% of people are now, it means you can get a cleaner build that has less cables. And I guess you could say it is slightly easier to plug in as well because everything's all in one place round the back. The problem is, of course, that you need both a compatible motherboard and a case in order for this to work, because most cases, if you grab one of these motherboards, the connections on the back, obviously they're touching metal, so you can't plug anything in. So we're seeing quite a, a big phase and rollout now of different manufacturers rolling out cases that are compatible with this. 
and ASUS and MSI actually releasing different motherboards uh, that are compatible with this. And there are a few differences. The ASUS one is definitely better in the sense of you can actually plug in a graphics card as well and have that wire free. So you are getting a much more cable free experience whereas with the MSI version, you still have to plug in a graphics card and use those traditional cables. But the problem with the ASUS one is that it's probably gonna be a bit more expensive. You will need a proprietary graphics card as well. It actually uses like these prongs on the back to do up to 600 watts of power. So while I definitely think this is pretty cool and it does double up with a little bit more rigidity, you've got sort of two anchoring points on the motherboard, I want to see price. Uh, the MSI stuff has actually just started to come out. We've got a micro ATX case that we'll talk about in just a second and a micro ATX motherboard. They're calling this Project Zero. But I don't know, I'm not sure which side of the fence I'm on yet. I mean, I think it's great to have all of these uh, things around the back, but are people really that fussed? And if it is more expensive, is this actually going to be something uh, people go out and buy. Not 100% convinced at the moment, but we'll wait until I've done my build that I'm doing next week. Really excited for that. Get subscribed if you want to see my Project Zero build, because it'll be fun. But on the topic of cases, there was a lot at CS 2024. So let's discuss all of it right after a short word from this video's sponsor. Ladies and gentlemen, Loop Deck Live is here to make your PC life so much easier. This little box of joy is a powerful console for gamers, streamers, and productive pros that lets you open and control apps with buttons and dials, all of which are completely customizable. Best of all, it can completely integrate with your streaming setup, including OBS and Streamlabs, so you can start and stop streaming without exiting the game, as well as dynamically populate, organize, and control all of your scenes and sources within the Loop Deck software. Simply drag and drop actions onto the device, and you'll be ready to stream in no time. The Loop Deck Live S that I have here feels incredible. And then I love the fact that you've got these dials that you can also press, so this one could be your volume. And then you can cycle through different pages and have different presets with these buttons before, of course, actually launching something like YouTube, and then it'll come up on the screen behind you. There is so much customization here and support for so many different applications, with favorites including Twitch and OBS, Adobe Lightroom and Premiere Pro, as well as both Philips Hue and Razer Chroma. Both Loop Deck and Streamlabs are now part of the same Logitech family, joining forces to make your dream setup a reality. So what are you waiting for? Get yours today with that link down below. Oh, are we back already? Sorry, I was just folding up my pajamas. Let's talk about the cases then. And the first place actually that I want to talk about was Thermaltake. And this was actually one of my favorite booths that I saw because they had a lot of interesting stuff. Now I'm going to start by saying they've got a whole new color variant, which is blue that I really like, but this is meant to be like a 25 year anniversary thing. And they've put this pretty awful sticker on everything that looks like a sticker, but it's actually not. It's in the print or in the paint. So you can't remove it. And I'd be honest, I don't like it, which is a shame because I really love the color scheme that they've got going here. And they've said, that this is just a limited version that they will then do the blue version of without the sticker at a later date. But yeah, I think um, I think that will upset some people. But something else, or at least the first thing that I saw that I was really impressed with from Thermaltake was the Tower 300. And obviously this is a little bit different. So the mass of market appeal of this probably isn't gonna be you know as good as some of the other cases. But I built in the Tower 200 and was, was really impressed. But there definitely were a couple of sort of sore points that could have been fixed. And they've done that this time. I think the overall design is a lot nicer now because you've got this like octagonal uh, sort of shape to the front where you've got a bit more shaped glass which is pretty cool all the panels you can just press and they pop out so you can get in a lot easier and on the top as well the fan bracket at the back actually like completely removes and folds away which is pretty cool because it just means getting into the top is a bit easier and don't forget that because this is almost like a vending machine style pc you have the io actually sticking up at the back of the chassis which means to plug anything in you do have to take it apart a little uh, but they've made it a lot easier to do so so if you do just want to like plug in a usb drive is not quite so bad so if you're wanting a traditional design they also had two other cases to talk about the first one is one of these uh, like msi and uh, asus compatible cases so it's just a revision of what they've got already, really. It's called the Ceres 330TG. It's pretty nice looking, but it's, again, quite minimal, really, in its design. So it's not got any, like, crazy features behind uh, the extra support. So the way that they do this, by the way, for case manufacturers is just a little bit of extra tooling. So it might add a little bit of cost if they're doing two separate versions, where they just have the cut extra sections out for those uh, power connections to actually feed through. So pretty cool and nice to see that more manufacturers are doing this. Again, watch this space 
because you won't have too many options at launch if you do want to use one of these new systems. Uh, but then there was also something uh, that's definitely a lot more out there. It's a bit more of an expensive glass chassis and it actually comes with a Gen 4 riser and then this sort of like floating GPU mount in it, which is definitely very different. I mean, I will say that I did notice because they were using such a big graphics card, there wasn't like a huge gap actually between the glass and then the fans that were on the graphics card, but obviously you can like, adjust this, I guess, or use maybe a smaller graphics card. But because you can fit so many fans inside this, airflow is still gonna be really, really good. And it's nice that it does come with it, gives you an option to have something that looks completely different, a lot more of a showpiece build, without it just looking like a carbon copy of what was it, the Lian Leo 11 that kind of all cases now kind of look like. So yeah, nice to see something a little bit different. This one being called the CT E600 MX. And I will go ahead and check my notes again because I'm terrible with names, but one other one that I really liked was from Asus and this was called the Tough Gaming GT302. It's not as heavily branded actually as some of the other tough cases, which is good. I still think there's perhaps a tiny bit too much for me. Maybe like the text or the logo is a little bit too big, but. JJ from ASUS was a bit surprised that I said that. It's like, but this is really minimal. It's like, yeah, but people like like nothing minimal, but yeah, no, I mean, I'm exaggerating. It's nice and clean, as I say, I really like this. It reminds me of a deep cool case, actually, uh, where you've got these large squares for the airflow uh, in terms of like the mesh cutouts. It's, it's a pretty cool case, but of course this supports ASUS's system. And I guess it supports MSI's as well, because the cutouts are pretty much in the same spot. I haven't actually asked them this, but I don't know. It's definitely going to be favorable, isn't it, that you use the ASUS system for this. It's coming very soon, and it should retail for around about $110. In terms of what's coming from MSI for their Project Zero range though, uh, they do actually have some internal cases. There was one that the, I don't know, they, they're showing off like this really cool like big glass case and it even had like a curved edge to it, but they say this is still like very much a prototype, so I don't know, there's not really too much to talk about there, but it's got a curved piece of glass on the front that was pretty cool. But the one that's actually coming out very soon, or might actually have landed now by the time you're watching this, is their Micro ATX case. And I would say that's a, not a shame, but I would assume that this had been an ATX case because it's quite big, uh, but it supports Micro ATX motherboards from the Project Zero range, and this is the build that I'm going to be doing. Uh, next week, as I say, I think my one is all white, but yeah, it's, it's a nice looking chassis. It's nothing completely crazy, but you do have this sort of like curved glass edge to the side of it, which looks really nice actually. It almost reminds me a little bit of like a height case or something like that, but it's still got that MSI flare on it. A big fan of this actually, looking forward as I say, to uh, doing that build. Ah, uh, yes, we also have quite a few cases to talk about from Cooler Master. And the one I want to talk about first, because I know most people are going to be interested in this, is a revision to the NR200P. So this is called the V2. And they also had this weird concept version of this where it's like glass all the way around. And the rim was bright in there. Okay, I will give them that. And it's got an LED uh, or LCD screen in the front and you just couldn't really read it at all. And you couldn't see inside the chassis, so. This was a prototype, but yeah, I think they probably need to reduce the thickness of the glass or reflectivity or something here. I had a lot of fun filming that circular shot that you're hopefully seeing now, uh, just to illustrate how you can't really see anything inside. But yeah, pretty cool, um, something a little bit different. But the version that you actually probably care about is the V2 that's coming. And the main fix really is that it now comes with a Gen 4 riser cable. The old one was Gen 3, caused issues. Uh, not their fault, but they revised that, it's great. Price point is similar. I think it's around about $120 or so still, might be slightly more than that, uh, slightly less. Uh, also supports larger GPUs, really. That's the main change really because obviously since they first brought that out graphics cards have got bigger so it's nice for them to sort of catch up they've revised like the look of the panels as well like the airflow has changed ever so slightly so hopefully uh, that's even better as well but this is more reminiscent actually of the max version of the NR200P rather than the original it does also have USB-C now as well which is pretty cool something that was a bit odd and there were quite a few odd things actually at the Cooler Master booth including like shoes and was it Sharks? But mainstream, they have the TD500 Max, and this solves a problem I don't think people had. Sorry, Cooler Master. Uh, you let me know, send me the sales da data in a year's time, and we'll see who was right, who was wrong. They actually sell this with an 850 watt power supply pre-installed, and an all-in-one pre-installed. But it's a big case, so I don't really understand who this is for. It also has cable connections on the motherboard 
themselves. So I guess in theory, you don't really need to go around the back much at all. You get these little extension power cables that then connect into like the front of the motherboard where you've got these pass-throughs into your board. I, I just don't understand it. Like, what, why? Why? If you're building a PC, you're building a PC. It's not like it's taken all of the difficulty out. The power supply and the cooler isn't really the difficult bit. You've still got to mount it. You've just not got to mount the radiator, but you've got to mount the pump head. So I don't really get what the point of this is. It just seems unnecessarily complex. I liked the TD500 mesh, but I wouldn't say this really changes much. So yeah. Uh, as I've put down in my notes, it's a bit odd. They also have something else that's a bit odd, I'm afraid, which is called the Masterbox 600, and it comes in a couple of colors. The white one, I didn't get to see, is a shame, because they told me this is all white. Great. The one that they were showing off was a black version that has two sort of white stripes on the front, but it's not like really white. It's like off gray sort of white, and it just doesn't doesn't work in my opinion. But this is another one of those cases that do support the new standard from Asus and MSI, which is pretty cool. So if you want to do like a cableless build, uh, this is another option. Hopefully it shouldn't be too expensive. Masterbox range isn't usually. But guys, guess what? I got out of the hotel room and I found some more cases, bonus cases, ladies and gentlemen. We're here at Corsair and there is actually this. The 6500, this is a very cool looking case. Really, really excited to test this one. They've also shown this little like cap off for one of their coolers, like sidebar, that looks really nice. I think maybe-ish, like $20, $30 TBC. Very, very cool. But as you can see, this is like a dual chamber sort of design case. This also is gonna support both ASUS and MSI's sort of clear cabling system as well. So there's a Project Zero board in there at the moment, and then a ASUS GPU. So it's very representative of what you're going to get. But there's loads of room in this and it's fairly modular as well. So you can get it in a mesh version and these panels as well at the top, as we see when you go to the other chassis can be swapped out to like a different sort of finish, including wood, metal, different colors and things. So really, really cool. So that's the 6500X, but if you want something a little bit smaller then Micro ATX is back and we have this. And it's definitely a very different looking chassis. They've also got an air cooler called the A115, so A115 I guess is the best way of saying that. Uh, that's what's in there at the moment. And these are the optional panels, so these are like the wood finish that you can get and it customizes uh, very easily because you can just sort of take them on and off and replace them as you will. I mean the wood is real wood, so I mean this one as you can see has uh, been touched or damaged a little bit by the press, but I mean that is what you're gonna get if you swap for a wood finish rather than metal. I think this will probably look nicer in white if I'm honest, but obviously it does depend on the build that you're going for. I mean, this is obviously a smaller chassis, so there's a lot of components in here to sort of show you what you can do with it. So it does look a little bit cramped, I'd say, with that air cooler and the Strix graphics card. But I mean, the fact that it can accommodate it in what is a smaller chassis is pretty darn cool. I will show you around the other side of this chassis, but it's quite difficult to move with one hand. This is the 2500X, by the way, I realize. I didn't mention the name of that, but once again, this is another one of those motherboards that supports the MSI and ASUS sort of cableless systems. So you can see that's what we've got in there. And despite the fact that it's a smaller chassis, we still have loads of space here for cable management. Obviously, it'll be slightly different if you use a power supply that has the cables coming out this way. This is one of their shift ones, which still should be plenty of room there. But you probably noticed that those are actually slightly different fans to what you've seen before, because Coursera are also launching some new fans. These ones are called the RX and you can get them in both 120 and 140 like we have here. So the magnetic, so once again, they should, if I can line them up properly, yeah, snap in uh, just like that. Obviously you do need the connections to carry the data and to give it a bit more rigidity between them, but then it's part of the IQ Link software suite. And these are actually slightly higher performance fans, which is quite interesting, uh, rather than uh, the QXs that we saw before, but there's a lot less RGB. Uh, in fact, you can actually buy them without any RGB. They don't have the temperature sensors in either, but realistically, I think it's gonna make a lot more sense to most people to go for something that's a little bit more affordable. I mean, I guess if you go for like a white chassis, have all white fans in there, will look really, really cool. And then obviously, easy to cable manage because you don't have to worry about all of those cables. So yeah. Pretty nifty. Ah yes, this is where the notes really do start to come alive because I've also seen a lot of gaming laptops at the show here and this is the one that I brought with me. Asus happily loaned me this for a couple of weeks. Zephyrus G16, but actually the ones that I want to talk about are the new 14 inch versions that are kind of like hybrid 
gaming laptops and just normal laptops, and they're fantastic. So they use the new Intel Core Ultra chips or the new ones from AMD Ryzen. Uh, they come with OLED screens, a lot of these, so they look absolutely stunning. And actually, the favorite one that I've probably seen, besides the Zephyrus G14, that's a bit more premium, uh, but in terms of just like mass market appeal, really excited to see the Omen Transcend 14, so I'm hopefully getting this in in a couple of weeks. It was using a slightly cheaper, like, plasticky chassis, but it looked premium and still felt premium. Ridiculously lightweight, and as far as I could tell, wasn't really making much noise when it was actually uh, playing all of these games. And that's quite difficult to do, something that's thin, light, portable, has a lot of graphics horsepower in it, and it was just able to sort of do everything. So, I don't know, maybe I've got it all wrong and when I actually test it, I won't like it, but no, I think that was pretty cool. There was also the Acer Swift X14 as well, similar sort of vein to the others, really. I uh, saw this at the Acer booth, nice looking laptop. I wouldn't say it was quite as standout as some of the others when it comes to the design, but it's still really nice and sleek, and until I actually get a chance to game on this and listening to, listen to the like, acoustics of it, then I can't really judge, because I think the best one of these is gonna be the one that has the best screen, but I think most of them come with OLEDs, or at least OLED options, and then obviously the ones that can stay cool and quiet when you're using them and have decent battery life. So I know there'll be a few different changes. Watch this space, though, really good if you wanna get into sort of hybrid gaming laptops, which are personally something I'm um, a, a big, big fan of. And speaking of a big, big fan, I mean, they didn't have a big fan there, but they had lots. The final stop was Height, and this is their new ecosystem that is very, very similar to Corsair's uh, QX IQ Link fans that we tested not that long ago. So you have like a daisy chain system. The main new product that they were launching was called the Thick Q60, the Thick Q60 radiator that honestly looked like that with the fans applied. And the idea really is that there's a lot more cases, obviously height seldom, that have all of these side slots. And just a normal standard thickness radiator goes there, but it's just wasting a load of space. So they're saying, what if you get a much thicker radiator, thicker fans, put them together, you get much better cooling, and it's not really gonna, well, probably cost you a little bit more, but in terms of space, it's not gonna cost you anything. It sounded very quiet when I was there, but I mean, that's not the ideal place to actually test all of this stuff, but they did show me how the whole ecosystem works, so the fans just interlock together purely by magnets, you don't need any extra clips or anything. It is very strong. Obviously, if you're fiddling about with your fans all of the time, then it's probably not gonna last as long as some of the other solutions, but clearly it doesn't really matter because you can just screw them down anyway, but you can date chain these together and very similar as I say to IQ Link you have these cables that can then connect all the different devices together so uh, I can't remember exactly how many it was it was like 40 50 ish devices you can have on uh, one of these whole systems they will sell a separate hub if you want to go down that route but they're expecting most people just to use the cooler as the sort of hub and heart of the system I don't think you have any extra cables coming out of the cooler either but you do have this really weird LCD display that we've seen previously shown off but the product is now like ready to go now which is pretty cool so a little bit different. I do think this is very over the top, but a lot of people want over the top and they want excellent cooling. So I've, I've heard from some insiders that this is genuinely a very exciting product. They're also gonna be selling some RGB strips and the fans separately, but they're not selling the RGB fans that they're definitely 100% not developing yet. I don't know for sure, but obviously when you talk to them, they kind of like laugh and it's like, and we don't know what you're talking about. We wouldn't possibly be releasing anything like that. So yeah, I'm sure it's only a matter of time. But that's uh, PC Gaming anyway, uh, wrapped up at CS 2024. Let me know what you thought. Um, anything you've seen that I haven't, please let me know down in the comment section below. I love tech, love PC Gaming. Uh, would love to know anything I've missed. Let me know your favorites though. Smash the like button, really does help out. And of course, uh, get subscribed, as I say, to watch reviews of these products, builds and things when they come in. But genuinely, thank you so much for watching this video. Highly appreciated. Catch you in the next one.